Hey, this is Brian Peterson with Old Bodies Outside. And today I have Dr. Michael Brunson here, who he has a PhD in park management and conservation. And he has led an awesome life of being a practitioner in outdoor recreation and conservation of parks and protected areas. Um, including he has worked for the Appalachian Mountain Club, AmeriCorps. He is a certified park and recreation professional and also a Leave No Trace Master Educator. But one of the things that I am most excited to talk to him about today is his thru-hike of the Appalachian Trail. And for those of you that do not know, the Appalachian Trail is on the East Coast. It's a 2,100 mile continuous backpacking trail that's about 12 to 16 inches wide. And it runs from Springer Mountain in North Georgia all the way up to the middle of Maine at Mount Katahdin. So, Michael Brunson, thanks for joining us today. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's a pleasure. Yeah, yeah. So when um, wh when did you hike the Appalachian Trail? So I hiked the AT back in 2012, which sounds sounds like a long time ago right now. But yeah, back in 2012. Yeah, and what, what prompted you to go and stop your life for probably five months and go hike the Appalachian Trail? I mean, that to a lot of people, that seems unfathomable to do. Yeah, so, and I, and I get that question all the time, you know, whether it's from students or other people, um, especially if they don't have, you know, a, a background in, in hiking or backpacking or anything, you know, they always ask me what led me to that. But um, it was always something that I, so I'd known about it. I'd known the AT existed. Um, and part of that was um, kind of being at its doorstep because, leading up to that back in 2010 um i started work um in new hampshire with the appalachian mountain club um and that's in the white mountains there that was right on the doorstep of the at the at goes right through there um one of the great trail sections through that state um so i knew it was there it was something that i had uh either heard about even in, in books or popular magazine articles or things like that because um, I had been involved with outdoor rec stuff before. Um, so I think it was kind of a combination of being so surrounded by that culture, um, seeing even through hikers go through the town and area and on trail because working there, um, we would even be hiking on sections of the AT. So I was even putting my, you know, putting boots on the trail even before I through hiked it. Um, so I think a lot of it was just, it was there and I, um, knew about it and it was this opportunity that kind of presented itself because it was becoming more and more familiar and then ultimately i think it was a combination of that and then the flexibility of what i was doing so i was working seasonally i was kind of the traditional uh backpacking bum where you know summers were spent backpack guiding um fall and spring were I, I taught environmental education programs in the winter. I was a ski patroller. So I had that flexibility to just be like, okay, I can just stop working now for six, six months, five, six months, um, not feel like I'm quitting this, you know, huge career in my life. Um, and I can, I can do this thing and uh, head south and, and basically head back home. And I think that was one of those cool things too, where I was like, you know, I'm in New Hampshire. I'm one state away from the terminus, Northern terminus. Um, I'm basically going to be hiking home. Um, so I think that was a big push too. And then of course I had uh, uh, friends who had either um, hiked the AT before, or in this case, I had a friend who had always wanted to do it. So she kind of gave me the like, Hey, why don't we just do this together? Cause we're working the same job and Let's just give ourselves the accountability and kind of the push that's needed to actually do this thing. Nice, nice. You know, that familiarity and actually seeing people do this, this thing that seems really wild from the outside, really kind of crazy, um, goes a far away. So I backpacked the Pacific Crest Trail for three months. I covered about 1,400 miles um, back in 2009. And at that time I was living in San Diego in the Pacific Crest Trail. It was only about an hour east from me, but I never came across anyone that had been hiking it. I didn't come across anyone that ever talked about it. And, yep. um, out of nowhere, I, I came, came across it, uh, while trail running. And I was like, what's this Pacific Crest Trail? Um, didn't know about it. And it, it hooked me right away, but 
I was hooked in a cautious way. And what I mean by that was I still didn't have that familiarity aspect of actually talking to someone that had been on it for a significant amount of time. And so I actually turned to blogs and I read blogs of people backpacking the Appalachian Trail, the Continental Divide Trail, the Pacific sure. Crest Trail. And after reading those blogs and being like, okay, like, yes, this is a big undertaking, but there's actually quite a, a safety component to it. There's there's definitely some unsafety, unsafe aspects to it. I mean, you're very vulnerable when you're out there and bad things have happened on all of these trails. Um, but reading those blogs and seeing people do it um, really gave me the encouragement to actually be like, okay, I'm gonna do this. And so on the opposite order of things, you were hiking home and uh, I started uh, the Pacific Crest Trail near where I was living and then hiked away from home. Yeah. Um, yeah. And that, that ended up creating a problem later on because when I wanted to quit the PCT, I didn't make it all the way to Canada. Um, I ran out of money. And so when I wanted to, <laughs> <laughs> when I wanted to get home, I had to somehow find a, like I had to catch a ride for I think a couple hours to a Greyhound bus. Uh, and I took a 17 hour Greyhound bus oh. back to where I was in San Diego. And it was, um, not a very climatic way to kind of, um, finish off, uh, the PCT and my hike out there. But, um, it was something that to this day is, is such a wonderful, wonderful memory that I have. And both you and I work with students on a regular basis. And do you talk about your experiences on the Appalachian Trail? Do you, do you say, you know, Hey, this isn't a great option for young adults just graduating college. Do you, do you discuss that at all with your students? Yeah, yeah, I do. And I think it's interesting because it comes up in various ways. Um, I feel like either uh, my, because especially being out here, you know, Kansas State University, where, um, you know, you're hard pressed to find a, a hiking trail longer than, you know, 10 mile loops or something like that, where, um, you know, you certainly have some access to some, some fun local trails, but it's very different. It's a very different scale, right? So it's it's brought up in interesting ways, and one of those is that they either hear by word of mouth um, from people that oh did you you know did you hear that Dr. Brunson hiked the AT, um, and then they come to me asking about it, or I will bring it up. I have occasionally brought it up in in class, not so much to um, kind of toot my own horn and say you know I had this wonderful experience and I got to spend six months hiking through the you know, uh, Appalachian wilderness and things like that. Uh, but more as a way to connect what I teach um, from a conservation standpoint, from an outdoor recreation standpoint to say, hey, look, I've, you know, I'm not just talking about this. I've kind of lived it too, right? And I, I lived, uh, lived the experience and I um, know the benefit of, you know, trails and, and access through these areas. So I, I use it as a teaching, teaching tool as well. Um, but it's all, it is something, no matter how it gets brought up, um, as a way to maybe not just share my experience, but certainly like you were kind of speaking to, um, say, wherever you are in, in life, I guess, um, whether it's right after graduation or later on, which is you know what I did, um, it, it's an amazing experience that, um, can be fulfilling in a variety of ways because everybody starts, if, you know, whether it's the AT or any other kind of long trail, um, everybody starts that journey for different reasons. Um, so I've, I've certainly brought it up as, you know, if nothing else, um, if you've always wanted some kind of amazing outdoor recreation, hiking specific, obviously experience, um, it's something I, I wholeheartedly recommend in many ways. Yeah, I do too. And, you know, talking about the educational component of it, it's interesting that the community aspect of the AT and these long trails and the social psychology behind hiking these and the interactions you have and also the solitude that you find at times too is really, really interesting to talk about and how those have really long-term benefits in your life. Um, it, it, it's really something that um, even after just for me, it was three months being out there. It was like a major piece of self pride and patting myself on the back. So with the educational component, you got like this whole social psychology, mental health benefits, long-term benefits. Um, but also it blows my mind that if you have a 2,100 mile trail that goes from Northern Georgia up to Maine, being able to conserve that, 
that that land. So you have the trail that goes up, and it's kind of buffered on each side by a quarter mile, maybe. I don't. I really don't know. It probably depends on the area. Um, but that whole trail, and then buffered on a quarter mile on each side of a trail or so, is conserved and protected all the way up to Maine. And so. Back when I was uh, a master's student, I used to say that uh, my career goal in life was to actually establish more long distance hiking trails just because like it also conserves this like buffered piece of land. It's protected. It offers these great, great long term benefits for people. Um, and I used to always say that I was going to do that. But when these, these trails are kind of political in a way in that um, you have to per, put piece together public lands, whether it's it's U.S. Forest Service land or National Park Service land, along with private land. And so yeah. trying to piece all that together um, is got to be really, really tough. Um, and so when you're hiking on the Appalachian Trail, do, are there signs that say you're going through a private land area and it's kind of an easement? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's that's always that was always something that was that was really visible, um, and not just because of signage, but it was pretty obvious um, just on the the nature of the trail itself and where it goes. Um, it's it's obvious again, not just from the signage, but from the landscape itself, because you notice how that landscape changes. Oh, um, interesting. Yeah, yeah. I didn't think about so. That. Yeah, and, and that varies, you know, because you'd certainly be on sections of the trail where, um, you know, uh, you, you couldn't, you wouldn't be able to necessarily tell if this was just somebody's private land that was an extension of their backyard, um, or it was some kind of conservation easement, right? Whether that's some kind of easement between the Nature Conservancy and private landowners or, or otherwise. Um, but that was always something that was, that was, a, that was uh, present was, you know, signage or otherwise. Um, and I think that does kind of highlight, you know, you mentioned the, the political aspects and the maybe political challenges that those kind of um, uh, pathways specifically can, can face when it's that patchwork of, um, of access, really. Um, but I think it also provides, uh, you know, kind of a glimmer of, of opportunity and, and almost hope in, in, in that, you know, okay, we have this 2,000 plus long corridor, mile long corridor um, that cuts through some of the most amazing natural landscapes in the world. Um, and yet you have federal agencies, state agencies, uh, private organizations, nonprofits, NGOs, and private landowners all working together in some way to provide this incredible experience to, to really anyone, right? Anyone who can get there. That is, that's an amazing collaboration. And, and does that also include say the Appalachian Mountain Club coming in and helping out too? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, um, you know, they're, they're certainly kind of the, the drivers, I think these days, and they always have been, right? There's a reason why they're there. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I, I don't know quite as much about um, their, their hands-on approach to things and, and work that they do. But obviously they're, um, you know, I think the liaison between a lot of those, uh, agencies, organizations working with the private landowners too. So again, just that amazing. huge network, um, that's, that's able to, to come together to achieve that common goal is I think really, uh, inspiring. Super inspiring. So that, that's, yeah. you know, I never thought about that. You have as a hiker, whether you're a through hiker hiking the whole thing, going out for the weekend, or you're going to do a month, or you're going to do a day, mm -hmm. you go out there and, you know, depending on what your goal is, your motivation is, you might want some solitude. But especially when you're through hiking, you go through waves of a lot of community with other people. Um, you go through some solitude here and there. But I never thought about the volunteer community and just the synthesis of all these different community members coming together and to help out. And I know that each year, um, the Appalachian Trail mileage changes by just a smidgen here and there, you know, because they got to do, uh, they got to maintain some trails and sometimes there might be a fire. And so you got to re reroute around the, the, the freshly burned area. And so I did, um, back in 2015, I did uh, research on the Appalachian Trail and it's just kind of figuring out like what physical landscape features are the most important to 
these long distance hikers on the Appalachian Trail. And the, the, the topic, the theme that came up most commonly was the aesthetics of the trail. People really cared about how the trail looked. And yep. um, did you ever notice any differences in that, the way the trail is maintained, depending on if you're going through private land or if you were in state park land or if you're in U.S. Forest Service land or if you're in National Park Service land, like if you were to get dropped in each of those four locations, you know, we blindfold Michael <laughs> dropping these four locations, yeah. would you be able to tell, would you be able to, to determine like, hey, I'm on private land, hey, I'm on, I'm in the national park right now? Oh, uh, yeah, that's a, that's a great question, actually. Um, I feel like that's not like a challenge. Like, I want to do that. <laughs> like, so yeah. Yeah. That'd be a fun, fun revisit thing. Um, I, I think I'd be, yeah, I think short answer is yeah. I think there'd be certain things that I would be able to pick out. But I think interestingly enough, maybe it'd be more, I think it'd be more subtle in that um, depending where I was, because even, you know, you think about the changing landscape and, you know, uh, the, the, the trails down in, um, you know, Virginia and in Tennessee, when you're going through the Smokies and things like that are obviously very different from when, you know, oh, now we're up in New Hampshire and Maine in the White Mountains and 100 mile wilderness and things. So, you know, the, the landscape itself kind of kind of alludes to that. Um, but I think more so, um, I, I think subtle things like um, even the blazes, how the blazes are um, Interesting. maintained and even presented and even other trail signage. So not that, you know, not that that's giving it away because it tells you where you are, but um, in the name of the trail, but even the, the presence and um, amount of signage, I think plays into that. And you can kind of get an idea of, um, you know, maybe ownership of the land or where you are based on that, because yeah, when you're going through, some of those sections that are adjacent to more private lands, you don't see that as much. Um, yeah, maybe you're seeing less maintenance happening in some of those areas. So maintenance certainly plays a role in that. But I think for me, look at, thinking back on it, it was more, you know, how, um, how prolific signage was in aspects like that. Yeah, I, you know, I'm glad you brought up the, the blazes. And so the, the blazes, um, are marked on trees. They're little white triangles, or sorry, rectangles. Yep. And um, is the rule that when you get to one blaze, you should be able to see the next blaze? Yeah, should. I do. <laughs> I, keyword should. Yes, keyword is should. And I actually remember, and you know, my friends and I, we would, you know, whoever I was hiking with, we talked about that. That came up because yes, the the, I, and I think this goes for any blazes. You know, I, ideally they should when you have when you're at one, you should be able to see the other one. Um, and that's, that was pretty good. You know, again, the AT obviously so iconic. Um, I think those blazes are maintained and, um, kept, you know, more regularly and better than others. Um, uh, but it wasn't always the case. Admittedly, um, we found ourselves being like, all right, I'm at this place. I can't see the next one. They need to get in here and, you know, clear yeah. some vegetation or something like that. Um, but yeah, it's amazing. And that, that just goes on, you know, just to bring up that, again, that idea of the blazes. It's amazing, I think, how iconic the white blazes are. You know, there's they a reason are. why there's there's a blog there's a blog called White Blaze, um, and cool. it's just it's so um, it has become such an icon because you see, and even out here, can I've been all over the country, and you see that white blaze sticker on people's cars and things like that, and you're like, oh, they know about the AT or they've hiked it, and I think that's kind of a, a fascinating aspect of itself about how even the that white blaze um has become so iconic and memorable yeah it has it has um and how far back do those white blazes go have they always been the way that the appalachian trail has been marked for as far back as it goes that's a good question i actually couldn't i couldn't answer that i, I don't know the history enough to know if they started with that right away or if that was something that was developed later on to symbolize that distinction because you know you, you do have even on the at um and probably remember this too from your experience on it that any of those side trails are obviously different colors not just because they're off the at but everywhere where you go um you have the different color blazes they're usually distinguishing you know those separate trails as a, as a mapping system in and of itself so yeah I, I i don't know that's a good question 
But I, I do got to say that the white blazes, so, um, and I've noticed that, you know, when you got, uh, you're on the Appalachian Trail and you're, you're going northbound, or you're coming southbound, in your case, you're going northbound hiking home and you come across a trail that maybe perpendicularly crosses, it'll have blazes and say a blue blaze or a green blaze. And one thing that I have enjoyed about the white blaze is it stands out for my eyes. Uh, my eyes are able to see it very well. It's, it's, you don't see too many white rectangles out there in nature yeah. like that. And sometimes the blue and the green kind of blend into the, uh, the, the tree bark for me. Yeah, that contrast, I think you're absolutely right. It's that contrast between, um, yeah, whether it's the dark bark or rocks oftentimes, you know, because the blazes will be on rocks when you get on into alpine zones and things like that. Um, and even on sidewalks, you know, that's what's amazing too about the AT because some of the oh, right. sections go, they'll go right through town, right? You're not always in the woods. You're not always in nature. Um, the AT goes right through the middle of a lot of town. So um, you'll see those white blazes on the corner of buildings. And cool. telephone poles. Um, but you're right. I think that starkness, that contrast um, is another thing that just kind of sets sets the AT apart. Yeah. Yeah. The AT has got such a special history. It's a special place. It always will yeah. be a special place. Um, you know, one of the cool things that um, I came across a story when I was on the PCT and I thought it was just the most wonderful thing. And that was that there was a guy hiking the PCT. I never met him, but so this was a story kind of getting passed up the trail. It's in, I'm sure you're familiar with that communication, uh, oh, yeah. especially like I was on the PCT in 2009. You're on the AT in 2012. Cell phones weren't as prolific yet. And so a lot of stuff, a lot of information passed orally, word of mouth, as you saw people. And the story got to me that a guy was hiking the PCT who had never been camping in his life. <clears throat> never been backpacking in his life, saw something about the PCT and uh, maybe he's more wild than I am, that's for sure. But he went and <laughs> picked out all his backpacking gear, flew out to California and got a ride to the, the start of the Pacific Crest Trail down at the United States-Mexico border and went for it. And he had no experience whatsoever, no survival experience, nothing. Yeah. And I guess like he, he did phenomenal he finished he um i guess like you know for the first month he just kind of took it slow you know got sure. his bearings and you know just understanding the world and what his physical abilities were with backpacking and whatnot and so one of the things that i just loved about that story was i was like my gosh like these long distance backpacking trails look and sound intimidating they, they seem like you're just way out there you're super remote and whatnot but hearing the story of this guy doing it um, just was like, my gosh, like anyone could do this. And did you come across any similar type of stories like that when you were hiking the AT? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And yeah, you're right. You do hear those stories a lot. Um, I, I can't, I can't recall coming across or hearing about anybody with quite that dramatic of a, of a turnaround, you know, coming in with, with, you know, literally no experience. Um, but there were certainly plenty of people that, that I encountered, um, where this was really their big first foray into long distance backpacking. They had, they had done prep, whether they had done prep work, um, knowing that they were going to do the AT or at least had some kind of history of, of hiking at the very least. Um, you, you would still certainly run into people who, you know, this, this was a big deal. And this was their first real long distance attempt, um, or real attempt at, uh, a, a long distance hike. Um, but, you know, to, to go back to your point about, um, you know, kind of the uh, accessibility, I guess, of, of, and the, or the recognition maybe that anybody can do this. I think it goes back to that, you know, the, the adage of how do you eat an elephant, you know, one, one bite at a time, right? And I think the same can be said for, for the AT or really any of these long distance trails because, um, you know, I, I certainly had a, a, a background of, of hiking and backpacking. I had experience. Um, I had certainly never hiked that far before. Um, but even starting out, we were only hiking, you know, me and my friends in the group that I settled in with, um, we were only hiking around five to maybe eight miles a day starting out. Um, you know, we weren't hitting double digits for the first even few couple of weeks, I would just think. Um, if I remember correctly. So it was one of those things where you just, you start walking and you have that freedom and, and the flexibility because you've already committed 
the time to do this undertaking. Um, so you have that flexibility and freedom in many ways to just say, you know what, I've hiked a few miles, um, whether I'm tired or whatever, there's a shelter here, um, I'm going to stop. And then I'll set up camp and have my meals and I'll keep going the next day. So I think no matter where someone is on their experience level, um, recognizing that, you know, there's, there's certainly some safety issues to take into consideration. You at least should have some kind of awareness of what could go wrong and be prepared for that. Um, I think the beauty of those, those trails are that once you have that realization that you're not hiking all 2000 miles in one go, right. And you can hike two miles one day, you can have a zero day and, and not hike at all if you want. Um, you have that freedom, you have that flexibility, and it's kind of, you know, again, one bite at a time, um, one, you know, there's the whole, there's the adage to one step at a time, um, and uh, you just learn as you go. I think that's yeah. the way that you I, I love that. It, it, it just translates to, you know, I think life in general, where it's, you know, it's one <laughs> bite at a time, you know, I mean, it's this is how life goes, but mm -hmm. I know that, um, I fell into that trap a little bit at the start of just thinking about when I, so when I started the PCT, I mean, I had the goal of going all the way up to Canada and I'm sitting there thinking like, Hey, I got to get to Canada. I got to go. I got to go. I got to go. And it was just like, okay, let's take a step back here one day at a time. And it's like, you, I started hearing stories of people and I thought this was a really cool idea. Um, so, you know, you go into town and you got to take care of stuff. You got to do your laundry. You're like, Hey, I'm finally going to get a shower. Um, I yeah. need to call, family, check in. So, you know, when I, I'm going to hike into town, I'm going to take that day off. Or I'm going to take the following day off and do zero miles towards yep. uh, the AT. And something that I thought was a cool, and you kind of talked about it, alluded to it a little bit. But one thing that I heard stories of was people were like, hey, like, yeah, I do do zero days in town because I got to do in town errands. Like, you know, call my family and loved ones, take a shower, go grocery shopping and whatnot. But uh, I heard of hikers taking zeros on the trail. They come across a lovely place and they're like, Hey, this is a great Absolutely. river here. I'm going to soak my feet for a day. And I was like, yep. that's just, that's what this is about. Like, you know, just enjoying it. Yeah. yeah. Oh man. It's, I, I love these long distance hiking trails so much. Um, so the Appalachian trail, Pacific crest trail, continental divide trail, they're all national scenic trails. And yep. those are the three major ones in the United States. We have other ones too. We're very fortunate in the United States to have those. Yes. Um, but I think out of the Appalachian trail, the Pacific crest trail, and the continental divide trail, the only one that is, um, supported by the national park service is the Appalachian trail. Is that correct? That is correct. Yes. Yep. And how long is the National Park, do you know how long National Park Service has been supporting and helping out with the Appalachian Trail? I don't. That's, again, where my, my history only goes back so far with the actual kind of underpinnings and foundations of, of the AT. Um, so, yeah, I, I wouldn't be able to answer that one. Yeah, well, I, it goes to show you, though, how, I mean, for the National Park Service to come in and be supporting the AT, it goes to show you, like, what a national treasure it is. It's, it's absolutely a national yeah. treasure. Okay, so one of the cool things about the, the Appalachian Trail is that it is supported by the National Park Service. And I think that is an interesting um, trivia piece of trivia for the Appalachian Trail. An even more interesting piece of trivia for the Appalachian Trail is if you go and, and, and I'm not a big fan of doing this, but I find it very interesting, is that you compare the landscapes of the AT and the PCT, and people tend to just look at the PCT and say, oh my gosh, like they... It goes up to higher elevation, so yeah. it must be more challenging and more Harder, uphill. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And it turns out the Appalachian Trail, uh, mile for mile, is yep. more elevation gain than the PCT. And the PCT, yep. I think the highest elevation is like thirteen thousand one hundred feet. Where, but what's the high point for the Appalachian Trail? Yeah. So, um, and that's true because the, and, and I think there's something about. Um, you know, the AT that between the elevation gain and loss over the whole course of it, it's something like doing 20 Everests in a row or something like that. Like maybe that's an exact, that might be a little high, but it's a lot. Um, so yeah, you're absolutely right. People often overlook the fact that, oh, you know, no, the mountains aren't as tall. They don't peak as high because yeah, the highest point on the AT is Klingman Do Klingman's Dome. Okay. Um, which is um, in the Great Smoky Mountains. Yep. And I think it tops over roughly... It's almost 7,000 feet, it's like 6,000 
Uh, so I oddly feet, was so. talking about this yesterday. It's 6,643. Okay. Yep. <laughs> yep. There you go. Uh, I'm doing so, <laughs> Yeah, and, and that's the thing, and that's you know people hear that and they're like, oh, so yep. you know when you talk about the 14ers of Colorado and all the big peaks, you know people just think like, oh, it's not a big a deal or it's not as hard. But yeah, you're just it's amazing the ups and downs that you do because you're you're um, you're not there's not as much ridge walking, ridge hiking. You know you're not right, walking, and then you're on the same elevation for a while. You're going up to these peaks and then you're going right back down again into the valley <laughs> and then you're going right back up the next one. <laughs> Yeah, it seems like it's an up and down trail. And I wonder, I think the PCT has more switchbacks as well, which oh, makes it more yeah. gentle on the uphills where the AT has got yeah. some really extremely steep sections. It's rugged. It's rugged. It is. it is, And, you know, I, I recognize that I was spoiled in many ways by being in the White Mountains in New Hampshire for so long, for a couple of years, hiking because a lot of people will say, you know, the hardest sections of the AT are in New Hampshire and Maine, White Mountains, because it's you're above tree line more than you are in any other state, um, and you're going straight up some of these these peaks um, where, again, they're only topping four, or five, six thousand feet, um, but you're going straight up, and it's these granite slabs, and um, no, they. They didn't believe in switchbacks in New England when they were making these trails. And a lot of that was because of the, 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 the bedrock, the granite. It wasn't conducive to, um, you know, creating switchbacks the way they are out west. Um, so they just took this short, straight, sweet route up and um, you're, you're, uh, you're struggling in a lot of places. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's the, the short, sweet route straight up and dang rocky at times. Yes. Yeah. Well, and then I always like to say too, because, you know, people will say, oh, it's not as hard. Right. Um, even though that's so subjective. Right. Um, but I always like to bring up Mount Washington because Mount Washington is still, you know, known as the, the location of the country's worst weather. Um, even though, again, it's, it's not as high as some spots out West, but you know, the highest recorded land speed, uh, air, you know, wind speed over land is still Mount Washington. Um, the Mount Washington Observatory there. So they get crazy winds. Um, when I was up there hiking through the AT, uh, on a, my AT journey, um, we hiked up from the valley, which was, you know, 70 degrees and sunny, and we hit wind, hail, almost snow. Um, it's amazing how different the weather can change, especially in the White Mountains there. So I always like to bring up Mount Washington as, uh, oh, you, th you think it's easy? <laughs> um, try hiking Mount Washington in bad weather. Oh my gosh. Yeah. That sounds yeah. Uh, pretty rough. <laughs> yeah. And I've heard yeah. that Mount Washington, have they had a wind speed up there of almost like 200 miles an hour at one time? Yeah. Yeah. I think it was over 200 miles an hour and <sighs> I'm, I'm pretty sure it still holds the record for highest wind speed recorded over land. I think the highest wind speed overall was recorded over the, like off the coast of Australia or something like that. I could be totally wrong, but um, I think there is a discrepancy over, Highest recorded wind speed and then highest recorded wind speed over land, which I'm pretty sure Mount Washington still lays, uh, you know, still has the claim to fame for that. Wow, wow, wow. So yeah. when you're out backpacking, which weather do you hate the most? Rain, snow, oh. wind? I, for me, it's wind. Just this conversation of wind, I'm like, man, I yeah. hate working out in wind. And that's one thing we get to fight all the time here in Kansas. Um, I'm, you know, tomorrow morning, yeah. I'm probably going to oh, yeah. get up at, 5 30 and go running at mount mitchell and it's going to be 20 yep. degrees and windy and it's going to be like oh i hate the wind <laughs> yeah i think i think overall if i could get rid of one it'd be the wind i would agree with that um however i think when we start talking about how long something lasts i think i think you would have to finally or i would have to give in to rain because rain oh yeah it, it didn't, it, it wouldn't bother me so much if we would just get, you know, oh, we're hiking through a rain shower or, um, you know, we got a day of rain. Okay, that's fine. But there were a few times when, you know, you push two days, three days, four days of wet. Um, you're just saturated all the way through. It's really hard to, to get dry and stay dry. Um, then it was like, okay, that's, that's enough. Um, I, I'm running out of, you know, the little clothes that extra clothes that I would have, um, you're just so saturated, and you're like, "All right, that's enough rain." Uh, so I and think, that's yeah, wind, yeah. 
And it, yeah, you're absolutely that. Or that's what I've heard is the AT gets so much rain. And it's like you you hear PCT hikers being like, "Yeah, I was out backpacking for five months in the PCT. We had five days total of rain." Yeah. And it's like total difference. And like I gotta say, like that duration of rain is that can really kind of break you down psychologically, especially yeah. if you're not then- trying out. Yeah, you get the psychological aspect too, just like the drudgery of it. And you're like, why am I still going? You know, and, and honestly, that's why a lot of people stop because those, the, the emotional toll it takes um, of, of, you know, going through that and persevering through that is a lot. Um, but also then you run into the, the, the problems of your, your socks are soaked, your boots are soaked, shoes, whatever you're wearing. You run into the chances to get more blistery, blisters, um, injuries, slips, falls, things like that. Um, so obviously there's the safety issues associated with prolonged periods of rain and everything too. Yeah, well, connecting that back to what we were just talking about with walking on super steep, rocky yeah. terrain in the rain, yeah. um, that's got to be rough. Um, yeah. So I want to change the topic up a little bit. When you were on the AT, um, so to pose this this question, when I was on the PCT, I would wake up pretty much when I got light out, um, do my, my morning my morning routine and take maybe an hour or so to eat some breakfast, uh, maybe do a little bit of stretches before going, get going. And at the end of the day, I typically would finish hiking, like, I don't know, between 5 or 6 p.m. or something, um, yeah. eat dinner, and then I would um, crawl into my sleep bag when it was getting dark out, and there's always some personal time and whatnot. And so... At nighttime, um, let's say if you're hanging out in your tent by yourself, you know, it's not a night that you're in a shelter. Um, what sorts of things would you do um, at nighttime just kind of, uh, you know, to, while you're having a little bit of free time before falling asleep? Yeah, um, that's a great question because, yeah, I think it's easy to just think about, oh, yeah, you wake up, you eat, you hike, you find a spot to camp, you eat, you go to bed, um, which was certainly a lot of days um, just revolving around eating, hiking, and sleeping. Um, but I was, I was really fortunate to, um, not just start with, uh, a good friend that I finished the trail with. Um, so I always had that, you know, kind of camaraderie and, you know, opportunities to, to talk and hang out and things like that with, with somebody I knew. Um, but I also fell into, uh, kind of this hiking group, um, that we've most of the, most of the time we, we hiked together and even if we did split up during the day we always ended up at the same shelter or camp spot at night so it was really fun to like um have conversations you know get to know these people who i spent so long on the trail with and learn about them um so a lot of time was just spent talking with people and learning about their backgrounds and again why are they there what experience they had what brought them to the at um so just having really great conversations with the people that you meet on the trail um but i would also uh there'd also be really fun random bursts of like, we're going to make up games and, you know, just have like little uh, kind of parties at these shelters and whether it's playing bocce ball with rocks or um, you know, we ran <laughs> into uh, Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Bo- rock bocce. It's a thing. Um, rock bocce. There, oh my gosh. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> yep. uh, or, uh, there was a hiker. His trail name was um, Wiffle Chicken. And he hiked the entire AT with a wiffle ball and a wiffle bat. Um, nice. That's if, fun. Uh, you and your audience is familiar with wiffle ball. Um, yeah. And he carried it with it. And we would play wiffle ball at these shelters. So just it's, it's, it, it was just funny how little things like that would, you know, happen and just found yourself passing the time. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it's amazing the bonding that I had in those situations because – everyone was disconnected from everything else. Like all that was going on was the moment. People weren't connected to the internet, checking email, doing text. People were, you know, pretty much disconnected from their phones. They may not have cell phone service at the time. um, And they had nothing to do until it gets dark and time to go to bed. And the bonding was significant with other people I hiked with. And um, so the the group that you ended up uh, traveling with on the AT, um, do you all kind of keep in, in in contact still and check in with each other? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And that was that was probably one of the most amazing things that came out of this experience, um, not just during the hike, but afterwards, because um, there's this group, uh, there's about six of us uh, outside of myself, six others that were part of this group that we I still keep in touch with. 
um, and get invited to their weddings and, wow. um, you know, get birthday messages and send birthday messages to, even though we're all around the country now, um, but we'll send, you know, random messages to each other and reminders and, you know, oh, it's our trailversary, you know, remember when kind of thing. Um, so I think that was a hundred percent one of the most amazing things that, um, came out of this experience was the friendships that you make, not just on the trail, but that have continued on, um, post post hike. Yeah. I, I I've never heard that either. Trail anniversary. I love yeah, that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. So That's awesome. around, uh, yeah. October 9th, my trail anniversary came around. So again, we get, you know, random messages about Apple happy trail anniversary and things like that. So. Oh man. That's fantastic. Yeah. I, that, that's such a significant aspect. You know, I think, uh, a lot of people just focus on the physical of, you know, I made yep. it from, I did the whole AT, the physical component of that, but the bonds and the friendships that grow from that, it's, it's something that there's a bonding over uh, mutual achievement and doing yep. something together. Um, that is fantastic. So I wanted to ask you, you got, you have a little one in your life and would you ever, uh, you know, kind of promote her to go be like, Hey, daughter, you want to go hike the, the Appalachian Trail, you know, someday, and maybe it's something you do together, but yeah. do you foresee you kind of, you know, telling about your, your stories and whatnot and, you know, seeing if she's interested or not? Oh, hundred percent. I, I would love not to, you know, I obviously want my, yeah, I have one, I have one daughter now, she'll be two in uh, a few more weeks here. Um, so blessed to have her in my life right now. So whether it's her or any other children, my wife and I are, are you know, fortunate and blessed enough to have later on down the road. Um, I absolutely want to, uh, promote experiences like that. And, you know, I, would like to think I'm not going to be the father who, who forces any experiences too much, even though I'm definitely going to be the dad who forces my kids to go camping, whether they want to or not, <laughs> nice. um, cause that, that was, that was me growing up. But, um, yeah, I, I absolutely want her to at least explore those opportunities and I'm going to do my part in at least promoting those because it goes into more than just you know, oh, it'd be, you, you would really benefit from hiking the AT. So not necessarily that approach, but more, this is an amazing opportunity to um, have, have time, whether it's with yourself or with others around you um, in a unique and wonderful environment in the natural world and to have these uh, valuable and potential life-changing experiences, whether you're hiking 2,000 miles or even hiking 50 miles or just doing an overnight here or there. Um, so I think, you know, I, I, I envision myself approaching, approaching this thing is, you know, I'd love to revisit some of those sections on the AT with my family and take the kids along and do little mini hikes, section hikes that, that had meaning for me or that I want to revisit, to, um, hopefully plant that, you know, spark that, that interest at least. Um, but yeah, that's, that's absolutely something that I would, uh, hope that, you know, my kids could, could enjoy one day. Yeah. And it's, you know, as, as a parent, it's not like you ever want to just be like, you know, obviously like there are some experiences where it's like, Hey family, we're going camping. That's what we're doing right. for vacation. Right. Um, something that's a significant experience like that, where it's a five month, you know, five month experience. Of course we want to see our kids do it, but you know, giving them the shove into it is a little bit tough. And so I've, I've always been brainstorming, not always, I've been recently brainstorming. Um, how could I help <laughs> get my kids to eventually hike one of these long trails someday? And I've been thinking about like, gosh, like, you know, if I, were to establish instead of establishing a college fund for them, what if I established like a uh, a travel fund for them? So um, I put aside fifty bucks a month or so, or hundred bucks a month, um, and then I turn it over to them and I give them that money um, yeah. when they graduate college. And let's say it's you know say fifteen thousand bucks or so, and I'll say, hey, like I want you to use this to go travel or yeah. do a long distance hiking trail or whatever. And um, so that's something that I've been contemplating for. Uh, my two step kids is kind of putting together those funds for them so yeah. that um, they can have these benefits, these long term impacts yes. for their life that are just so positive and fantastic. Whether it's traveling yes. or you know hiking the AT or the PCT. Absolutely. Um, yeah, yeah. Well, Dr. Michael Brunson, I want to say thanks for coming uh, coming on the show today and doing this interview and talking about the um, the Appalachian Trail. It's great to kind of relive those nostalgic moments of uh the at and the pct so thank you very much 